Okay, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, th thank you all and uh, good afternoon. Uh, I must uh, thank, thank the organisers for the kind invitation to speak at today's conference uh, and apologise for not being able to be there in person. Um, as you'll see through my presentation, we have a number of very important issues that are unfolding in British racing presently and uh, uh, as a consequence I've been required to attend a number of meetings here in London today and tomorrow. Um, my name is Brett Dunshay, I'm the Chief Regulatory Officer of the British Horse Racing Authority for those that, that don't know me and I'm responsible for all of the uh, integrity and regulatory functions uh, of British racing uh, across our 59 race courses. Um, I think it's important in any presentation like this where we're setting out the, the current conditions and prospects of, of our domestic racing industry here in Britain, just to give a little background for, for all those in the room that may not be fully familiar with the, the current state of British racing. Um, the British horse racing industry is regarded as a world leader internationally. Uh, we are the second largest sport in Britain by jobs, revenue and attendances behind football. And we're very much an ingrained part of British sport culture and society. Um, it's a significant industry in terms of its economic impact. Uh, it's worth 4.1 billion plus to the um, British economy uh, and provides direct, indirect and associated full-time employment for tens of thousands of people across the sport and its associated um, supporting industri industries. It generates substantial uh, inward investment into the UK and it has a large geographical uh, breadth. Um, we have, as I previously indicated, 59 race courses across Britain, Wales and Scotland that we're responsible for hundreds of training and breeding yards and breeding operations and most importantly uh, to to government is that we are predominantly a rural based sport and provide significant uh, jobs and economic uh, support to the the rural economy uh, the, uh, the British Horse Racing Authority, so my organisation, um, is a relatively new organisation. Uh, we first came into uh, existence uh, a little more than a decade ago um, after our sport has evolved in terms of its, its governance and regulation model. Um, back in the day, it was the, the jockey club that previously were responsible for the regulation of the sport, but now it's the British Horse Racing Authority who govern, regulate, and represent British horse racing um, as a collective. We're responsible for leading and coordinating the activities which ensure the overall health, development, and growth of the industry. And most importantly, we, as an organization, prioritize the welfare of both our horses and our people. But of course, like at any sport, uh, there are current challenges for British racing. Uh, and when we look at those broken down, um, of course, we look at global competition. So Britain sits at the, uh, at the top of the or pinnacle of the international racing and breeding uh, sector in that almost a third of flat horses rated 120 plus in 2021 were trained in Great Britain. We had 16 different races in Great Britain in the top 10 worldwide uh, since 2017. We have buyers from 50 plus countries across the world purchase thoroughbreds at our sales. And we have more than 1,850 horses in training in Great Britain and they're owned by more than 1,000 um, individual international owners. Yet, International funding disparities mean that British racing is at an increasing risk of falling behind uh, others in this global race. We have too many horses currently leaving Great Britain, impacting on our overall racing product, 
and to an extent we may see that from time to time, even just recently with, with small fields in some of our, our Group 1 and best races. Um, a further challenge is the, the structure, and it's interlinked with the, the, the previous uh, slide, but the, the uh, way our industry is funded. So in Britain, the horse race betting levy is a piece of legislation which um, uh, supports the financing of the, of the racing industry and it's closely linked to the, the UK betting sector. The levy is our central funding mechanism, so uh, it's, it's uh, paid into by betting operators based on their profits from their betting activity. And it's based on 10% of their gross profit. Now, levy reform was reformed in, um, in the UK in 2017 by the government to capture uh, return from offshore based online betting um, but further levy reform is crucial to help us remain competitive and allow us to increase our prize money returns support our people the racing businesses and the uh, continued growth of the sport to continue to enhance our world leading racing product and support equine welfare development veterinary science and and the research that supports those um, important areas uh, and to continue to further progress our world-class regulation and integrity. So presently, uh, and this is linked to the, the, the levy uh, that supports our funding, is that the UK government announced uh, the Gambling Act review. Uh, the UK government uh, is looking at gambling legislation presently it was last considered in 2005, and the government have recognised a need for it to be fit for the digital age. A white paper was released in April of this year, so just a few months ago, with a significant number of further consultations to take place um, as a consequence of that. The key areas of focus for racing as part of that work is looking at gambling sponsorship and advertising, player protections, and this also includes the concept of affordability checks for people um, betting. Looking at the powers and resources of the current Gambling Commission, and also the government are very keen to further enhance uh, its safer gambling strategy and racing's obligations as a betting product to support people that might um, come to difficulty with respect to, to, to gambling addiction and such like. A further challenge is of course one that everyone would be familiar with uh, globally and that is uh, animal welfare. Uh, it's obviously a key reputational and existential risk for the future of our sport uh, and it's obviously set against an evolving, you know, evolving public and political views and expectations. Recent polling here in the UK um, identified that 68% of the UK public oppose the use of the whip in racing, according to a YouGov poll for Animal Aid, who is of course an animal uh, rights organisation. Um, we had pro protests, animal rights protests at the Grand National, the Derby, and numerous other fixtures uh, during the course of this uh, spring and summer where protesters, attempt, uh, protesters attempted to advance a cause through quite an aggressive media campaign. And of course, as a, as a threat to us, you know, the onus is on all of us um, as um, passionate racing fans who love our horses is to continually make a strong, constructive and compelling case for racing with clear messaging around our safety record, unparalleled care of our horses, and the ongoing efforts we adopt as a sport collectively to reduce avoidable risk to our uh, equine and human athletes. Um, Britain have really attempted to take the lead on this internationally. Um, and we are very proud of the fact that we believe we champion uh, world-leading animal welfare standards in British racing. We've spent 
in the order of forty million pounds since the year two thousand uh, in veterinary investment. Fatalities, race day fatalities are down by a third uh, to a five year rolling average of zero point two one percent. The independent horse welfare board, which was established just uh, three or four years ago. Uh, developed a strategy focused on ensuring that all horses bred for racing lead a life well lived with improvements, welfare improvements including um, now having a process of improved lifetime time traceability where we have 30 day foal notification as a mandatory regulatory requirement for all breeders we've developed in conjunction with researchers work on the innovation of fence design and construction which includes as you can see on the screen there uh, up in the top picture uh, research to develop better colouring for obstacles and fences for example across all of our race courses. We've worked hard to develop a jump racing risk model based on algorithms to help us inform policy around uh, programming and uh, mitigate and minimise the risk that certain variable factors might contribute to um, particular race types. We've undertaken a review of aftercare and uh, sought funding to support a more holistic aftercare provision for thoroughbreds after they finish their racing careers. We've also We've also uh, undertaken a significant public consultation around the use of the whip in British racing and the beginning of this year implemented new regulations around the way the, the whip is used. And I'm pleased to say that at our first six month review since the introduction of the new regulations, like for like from 2022, we've seen a 50% reduction in the number of breaches for whip related offences despite um, enhancing the, the, the scope and scale of how those regulations are enforced, which is very pleasing. We're now moving into a phase of developing research to better inform future policy position in relation to these uh, issues around the use of the whip. We've introduced now a process of mandatory um, regulatory enforced trot ups and, and uh, veterinary reviews of horses prior to race day or prior to taking place uh, in, in the field on a race day. Uh, we see that now at all the major jumps uh, festivals and from this summer we started introducing them into our major flat fixtures and, and uh, presently piloting, rolling them out to uh, lower grade fixtures across the country. In conjunction with this, we've also um, required mandatory review of trainers' uh, medication records and veterinary records for, for horses competing in high-profile meetings in order for us to identify where there may be some sort of issue uh, that can be dealt with before a horse places itself at risk on a race day. So those are the challenges, um, but I'm pleased to say that uh, I've been here in Britain with the British Horse Racing Authority for nearly a decade and uh, for the first time uh, following a review of our governance structure we have a process in place at the moment to uh, develop a, a, a cross industry supported long term industry strategy which is incredibly important um, for delivering ongoing improvement uh, across the sport. As part of that, um, the sport under our member-based structure, so this is all segments of the industry, race courses, our horse people, uh, our regulator, our breeders, have all unanimously um, agreed uh, on a new strategy with serious and radical changes to make long-term improvements to the sport here in Britain. Uh, good work is being undertaken in many places but collective action is obviously needed for, for growth and we see this 
as an opportunity uh, for us to shape racing's future and strengthen our position as a world leader in thoroughbred racing and breeding. Uh, we're working through a process at the moment of establishing clear objectives and targets that need to be set. Uh, set. And the BHA have been empowered by all of our uh, member organisations to lead on this piece of work um, in terms of developing that strategy. Um, so setting the strategy out in terms of important uh, work streams and initiatives, uh, a lot of initial work has been dedicated to what our future racing product looks like. Some may have seen that recently we announced uh, a new structure for how our fixture list and racing product is developed from 2024. And that looks at the way the, the, the calendar of the year is structured, the presentation and promotion of our racing product, uh, including how we fund the various fixtures at the various levels uh, and, and the, the race program. And, and you may have seen, some may have seen this, the reference to the, this concept of premiorisation, where we're putting a real focus on our premium product and giving it the airtime uh, to, to uh, help deliver the best racing to the broadest possible audience in the best way. Horse welfare um, is absolutely fundamental to our new industry strategy. Uh, our commitment to collective lifetime responsibility to all horses bred um, for racing and there's a, there's a whole work stream um, under that pillar which includes the, the, all the recommendations from the Horse Welfare Board's strategic plan. Uh, industry people, so like many racing nations, we have our challenges with attracting people to work in the sport, and it's been identified that it is an absolute priority to ensure that we are recruiting and retaining a high-performing, diverse and inclusive workforce to sustain the racing product that we uh, we we, we um, reshape for the future. Uh, in terms of integrity, obviously, as a as a uh, regulatory and governing body, uh, we are prioritising our world class integrity and regulation. That's both on and off the race course, uh, and uh, specifically around that area, my teams have. I think it's 46 individual either projects or work streams um, seeking to improve the way we do things and strengthen the product that we're delivering to the world to bet on. Owners, uh, we want to make sure that owners uh, have a voice at the heart of everything we do. Uh, owners are so important to the, uh, the vibe of the sport and we must ensure that everything we do has a mind to the experience for owners um, engaging with us. Furthermore, betting uh, is another important area for us. Obviously, we want to increase returns from betting and we're working with operators as part of this broader review of the levy system that I referred to earlier to support a thriving racing industry uh, in a responsible way so that we can drive prize monies up and compete with some of those increasing uh, prize money uh, prize monies we're seeing across the globe. Uh, investors, we, we must, we've agreed, we must uh, continue to promote and secure more investment in British racing both domestically and overseas. Uh, whether that's through betting investment, but also through sales uh, and so on. Incredibly important to us globally as a sport, and we've seen this spoken about it at many racing conferences over recent, recent years, is fans and how we appeal to new and existing fans. Understanding what our different customers want uh, to ensure that we uh, have the greatest reach and greatest appeal 
uh, in what is now very much a digital age. We've also identified uh, the importance of corporate uh, social responsibility, enhancing racing's positive impact and its role as a force for good through the various uh, ways in which we can, whether that's reaching a more, more diverse uh, fan base, participation base, whether it's contributing to great causes, charities and such like. Um, there's any number of ways in which we can do that. And one very important way I think that the sport can do that, and uh, we've already undertaken a, an initial scoping exercise around how, from an environmental and sustainability perspective, we can take action and put in place measures to better understand our sport, the footprint we create, and how we can mitigate the risks that climate change present to us uh, as a sport, both domestically here in Britain, but I think it's also important internationally when we see here, for example, this week as we move into autumn here in Britain, we have the hot, some of the hottest temperatures we've had all year uh, presently. So um, it's in, incredibly important. But that sets a bit of a scene for where we're at in Britain. Um, it's been uh, a challenging summer in terms of some of the, the difficult pieces of work that we've, we've embarked upon in terms of the strategy, but also at the same time dealing with uh, the activism I referred to, um, all the while trying to run some of the best races um, in the world. Uh, and we believe that the development of the new governance structure and for the first time, a collectively agreed industry strategy, we are now well placed to deal with those challenges and, uh, and grow and, and prosper into the future. So I thank you all for your attention. That concludes my uh, presentation. Um, I'm very happy to take questions uh, from the room and uh, if you like, I can stop sharing my screen and at least then you can perhaps see me uh, on the screen. So uh, I'll hand over to uh, any questions if there are any. Thank you. Proszę, są pytania? Proszę dać. Hello, Can you Brian. see me on the screen? Can you see me on the screen now? Yes, we see you in a lovely office in, in London, probably. Danny, Thank Danny you. speaking Thank you, here. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Madsen. <laughs> I have a question for you regarding the fatalities. You said you were one uh, down uh, one third uh, in in a five yeah. year uh, rolling um, period to zero point two percent. First of all, what the, f the A question is: uh, Why did it? Uh, uh, become lower and two uh, is it divided between uh, flat and jumps racing or is it a is it a total figure so if you can f please uh, enlighten us uh, on the yeah. difference between the numbers of fatalities in flat and and jumps racing and even yeah, if that, you that see a difference between jumps and uh, uh, sorry hurdles and steeplechase yeah look I, I actually don't have those numbers to hand right now the current numbers but that number that I quoted is a a collective number and so uh, the reason it's come down is through uh, lots of really good work over the last 20 years. So we, um, we have a team of what we call race course inspectors who are responsible for ensuring that race courses adhere to um, a set of standards in terms of the way they present the race course ground, the way they uh, construct and configure fences, the way the stalls are operated, for example, uh, the way, even as simple as the way the, uh, the, the stable yards and the facilities around the course off the actual race course itself are uh, delivered to the sport. So that team have worked hard. They inspect every race course every year before their first fixture. They are involved in interventions if there are um, issues that occur during the course of a season. And then in addition to that, obviously 
you saw on my earlier slide, the investment that we've placed in uh, veterinary uh, improvements and research and development. So just over the last uh, you know, 10 years, for example, we've seen things like uh, the core of the fences at Aintree, where we run our Grand National, has been uh, redesigned and reconfigured so that it's not a hard core inside the centre of the, 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 the fences, uh, enabling horses to be less likely to suffer um, rotational falls if they um, do clip the, the inner core. Uh, we, we've already talked about introducing the mandatory um, trot-ups and uh, provision of medication records. Uh, j just this summer alone, like uh, at our major events, uh, I can recall four examples of where horses have been withdrawn on the race day after failing to meet uh, or pass a veterinary inspection prior to their race. And so, you know, we believe in combination all of these small things over time have enabled us to significantly reduce that fatality rate uh, collectively across the sport. Thank you. From, from the top of your head, would you know the difference between jumps and, I mean, how many times uh, uh, more dangerous are jumps racing than flat racing? Uh, it is, it is uh, significantly more. Um, and I won't give you percentages, Dennis, because okay. they, they do shift and we focus on a rolling average, but there is also a significant difference between uh, hurdle and, and steeple chasing, obviously. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm a race horses owner, but at the same time building racing clubs. Uh, UK has been famous for long uh, for a very strong structure ownership, which is moving more and more to collective ownership, be it syndicates, racing clubs, whatever we call it. First question would be, to what extent do you think the BHA has been uh, generating strongly input to that development of collective ownership? And what would be your advice to a country like Poland, to the horse racing authorities here, to favor the growth of collective ownerships, to make it happen? Sure. Um, what I can say is personally, I'm a huge fan of collective ownership. Um, we have taken significant measures in the past couple of years, actually, here in Britain to encourage uh, collective ownership and, in fact, strengthen some regulatory frameworks around that to protect those that invest into um, collective ownership through syndicates and such like. We now have um, a new uh, set of rules, uh, regulatory rules to support that. Um, we, we've now introduced a licensing framework for syndicate managers and it's absolutely um, a, a focus of uh, how we can grow ownership participation. I'm originally from Australia where this form of ownership is incredibly popular and seen as a important means of bringing new people into the sport and allowing um, people from all sectors of society um, to participate on the same level. And one of the important frameworks that's in place in Australia is that those that manage those syndicates have to comply with um, the equivalent type of regulatory framework that's in place for, say, example, the, the uh, financial services industry. So people are required to hold a, a, a financial services type license. And um, if you're offering a horse for syndication, um, you know, product disclosure statements and so forth from the outset. And, and there are mandatory requirements in terms of how uh, those syndication uh, organisations are run. So Whilst we have a different model here in Britain, um, as the regulator, we can put in place similar processes to that which I just explained for the Australian racing industry in order to offer greater protections. Um, and if people um, know that their investment is um, protected in some way, they'll be more inclined to want to invest 
that's one part of it. The other part of it is, in court, of it is of course, making it an experience um, that people enjoy and want to come back to. And, and many of our trainers uh, here, you know, offer great experiences for, uh, for their, you know, their owners. I've seen examples of where um, owners, uh, sorry, trainers have you know, built a standalone little entertainment facility in their training yard for um, collective groups of owners to come and spend some time uh, socialising but also seeing what's happening in the training yard. They're the sorts of examples of uh, initiatives that I think will help in this syndication space. But I, 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 I must say I think it's absolutely a, an important part of um, growing our overall ownership base. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity again. I apologise for not.